What's going on, everybody? Glad to have you back again. We're looking at a game from 1997 uh, between uh, Nigel Short with the white pieces and Alexei Shirov with the black pieces. It's another King's Gambit, and this game took place um, in Madrid, Spain in 1997. Game started off E4, E5, F4 from Nigel, accepted by Shirov. Knight of three, G5, H4, and G4, and Knight E5. Now, if you saw my last video, we looked at a game between uh, Grandmaster Alexei Fedorov and Alexei Shirov in the same exact opening. Uh, and the game uh, went Knight F6 here uh, instead of um, the immediate uh, D6. But here, Shirov plays d6, drives uh, the knight away. Knight takes g4, and now knight f6. Now, knight f2 was played. Um, it's possible uh, for white to play. Knight takes e4. However, at the time this game was played, this line wasn't uh, doing uh, too good uh, for white. Um it actually allows Black to develop uh, his game uh, quite easily after, let's say, Knight takes F6 check. Queen takes Knight C3 with this idea, of course, of jumping into D5. So C6, right, really easy to, um, you know, deal with that. And then Black has simple um, plans like bringing this bishop out here to um, strengthen this pawn or even bring the bishop to g7. But a lot of times the bishop will go to h6 to keep the g file clear for this rook to go here. Then this light square bishop ends up here harassing um, white on this diagonal d1 to uh, h5. After that, this knight ends up on d7. And then black castles queenside completing his development and then of course turns his attention uh to the center all right so instead of going into that scenario nigel played knight f2 which has its drawbacks because after all right you're trying to develop your pieces rapidly and uh moving your piece uh that many the same piece that many times in the opening is not conducive to rapid development all right so that leads me into white's problems uh in this opening so what did white want by playing f4 he wanted black to give up his portion of the center on e5 by exchanging on f4 and then at a convenient time white will just simply capture the uh material lost right in the perfect world of course black can hold on to the material as he does with g5 earlier and then here with bishop h6 so it's not easy for white just to uh, get his pawn back however to answer the question what did white want white wants exactly what you see here he wanted to have possession of the center having that full two pawn center so that he can use that to drive away Black's pieces, make it difficult for Black to develop, and eventually uh, start attacking Black on his side of the board. However, in exchange for getting that center, White winds up falling behind in development. Why? Because he moves the same piece several times, and you're going to see. he's gonna He moves this knight that you see on F2. I don't know if you count it, but he moves that knight about four times. And then you'll see the bishop on e2. He'll move that several times. And then also the knight that's presently on b1 and move that uh, several times. Right? So while white is having trouble developing, right? And um, the reason why he's having trouble developing is because of that pawn on f4 creating a wedge in the position. All right, so that's very annoying. And also, black is attacking the white center. 
So therefore, white has to make sure that center is protected. If he allows black just to win a pawn, then all of that loss of time uh, in development is in vain. All right. And white is down material. So white is giving up quite a lot just to have control of the center. But what white is hoping for is to be able to eventually consolidate. All right. Trade off some pieces, all right? Get his king into safety. That's another thing about the position is uh, due to the lack of development it affects White's king safety. As you can see, White is right in the middle of the board. Um, he's hoping to be able to consolidate and eventually go, you know, into an end game where his uh, control and possession of the center means something and perhaps gives him the end game advantage. Now, on the black side. Since white is taking all of this time maneuvering, right, moving the same piece around, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, black is able to develop freely. So black is like, go ahead, take possession of the center. I'm going to develop my pieces. I'm going to uh, hold on to that pawn, all right, and I'm also going to exploit the weakness on the king, uh, king side that's created, right? Look at the dark squares, E3 and G3, all right? And then black is also arguing that that center is just for show. That is really weak. It's really not going to be uh, anything uh, to worry about because white does not have the uh, proper peace support. So this is like the debate uh, between uh, both sides. So bishop h6, holding on to the material. Bishop e2. Queen e7. So you can see development and pressure on the center. Knight c3. Bishop d7. And you can see black's development is very easy. Bishop f3. So now you see that bishop moved twice. Right? From f1 to e2. Then from e2 to f3. And if you counted earlier, the knight that's on f2 moved four times. Alright? This is why... White is so far behind in development. But again, it's intentional. His argument is that, hey, it's going to pay off uh, down the road. Castle. All right. So black has nice, harmonious position. All he does is have to deal with white's center. And he's up material to boot. Here, Nigel plays the move A3. Now, I have these uh, pieces highlighted to show how many... Pieces are actually protecting e4. All right. But still, Shirov plays knight takes e4. You know why? Because of white's lack of development. Right? His king is right in the middle of the board. So this allows this move to be tactically feasible. Nigel plays knight d5. And we're going to go over the alternatives after the game. I just want to show you how the game went. Knight d5. Queen e8. Castles and now just f5. So now the knight is solidified in the center, which is bad for white because, again, this is why white played the king's gambit so that he could have possession of the center himself. c3. All right. And here, again, we're going to look at some alternatives later, but white fails to confront uh, black's idea. Rook g8, right? Where else? Right on the uh, semi-open file, rook e1. Queen f7, attacking the knight on d5. So now bishop takes f4. So now Nigel finally gets that pawn. Some piece, the bad bishop gets traded off. Uh, White's bad bishop, which was that dark square bishop. And knight takes f4. And now knight e7. Alright. Now, you can see... White, again, has three pieces converging on e4. And he plays the move. Knight takes e4 here to uh, you know, e e equalize the material. Remember, white is a pawn down. So f takes e4. And now rook takes e4 to protect the knight. However, Shirov has the move d5. All right. I don't think this was an oversight by Nigel. I think it was part of his plan. But perhaps he didn't see as far as Shirov did so d5 of course is questioning the rook and saying 
okay, you're going to give up the Rook or the Knight. Nigel, I'm sure, saw this and played the move Queen B3. Now you might be like, whoa, why do you have all these graphics? Okay, okay, I'll explain. First of all, the green arrow is just indicating the pin on the A2 to G8 diagonal. So at this moment, the pawn on D5 cannot capture the rook on E4. All right, so that's what that arrow indicates. The red arrows indicate blacks, excuse me, white's idea, right, to attack the weakness on B7. Right, just imagine if the pawn on D5 and the rook on E4 were gone. Well, white will have mate and one on B7. So that's what those arrows indicate there. So I think this was part of Nigel's plan. So Shirov plays rook D F8. So now the queen is no longer uh, in danger on F7. And now he is actually threatening to capture the rook on E4. Nigel just can't move the rook to e2 because it would drop the knight on f4. So he's forced to give up the exchange. Rook takes e7. Queen takes e7. Now the knight is still in danger on f4. However, again, like I said, I believe Nigel saw all of this. Knight takes d5. So now the queen is attacked and the diagonal is now open. All right. Again, we'll look at alternatives later actually we can look at an alternative right now so queen takes e7 knight d5 why not bishop d5 attacking the rook on g8 and the pawn on b7 well there's a simple refutation queen e3 check king h1 and now just simply c6 all right hitting the bishop and the knight the only choice bishop g8 doesn't work after rook takes f4 and now white is caught in a mating net as you can see the king is very vulnerable right due to the earlier weaknesses made on the queen side and the lack of of peace protection and uh general security around the uh king so nigel will get mated there this is why he plays knight d5 hitting the queen Queen takes h4 from Shirov, and now Nigel played knight e3 again with this idea of attacking uh, b7. If knight e7 check, right, with the idea of somehow um, uh, checkmating on b7, that would be an oversight. Again, queen takes e7, queen takes b7, king d8 check. The bishop will go back, and then after bishop b7, again, the same idea. Queen e3, king h1, queen h6, king g1, and then rook takes g2 is very strong. Bishop takes g2, queen e3, king h2, and rook f4 with the same mating idea. Okay, with the king uh, by himself like that and denuded against the queen and rook, he won't be able... Uh, to survive this idea of just rook to h4. Notice the lack of development of the rook on a1 and the queen on b8 is way out of play. This is why Nigel could not go for this idea of knight e7. So he plays knight e3, just simply um, threatening uh, to take on b7. c6, dealing with the threat. Now, some of you who are tactically aware are saying, hey, what about rook takes f3? After all, the um, king um, and rook on g8 are lined up, so therefore the g2 pawn cannot capture. So let's look at that. Rook takes f3, and as you can see, uh, the pawn cannot capture uh, on f3. However, the rook is hanging on g8, and that will lead uh, to disaster. So that's why rook takes f3 not playable c6 dealing with the threat and now rook f1 queen g5 attacking the knight so c4 protecting the knight and now rook e8 attacking the knight again knight d1 queen h4 
hitting the vulnerable uh, newly created created weakness on d4. And now d5 by Nigel. Right, still going with that idea of opening up the queen side. But Shirov ended the game with queen d4 check. And Nigel resigned. Why did he resign after queen d4? After queen d4, let us say knight f2, for example. If king h1, really powerful move right here, rook um, uh, e1. Rook takes e1, queen h4. King g1, queen takes e1, king h2, and then rook e8. And you have these same ideas with this mating net around the dark squares. And uh, this is not something I wanted to talk about or meant to talk about, but it keeps pro uh, popping up in these variations. And that is the fact that when you move pawns early in the opening, like in the king's gambit, for instance, making move h4, Weakening your king side, right? Making having to move f4 and h4, leaving these permanent weaknesses around the dark squares. In this case, you can see how they come come back to haunt white in many of these uh, variations that I'm showing on the board. It's the same idea popping up over and over where there's an attack on the dark square, namely h4, and also on uh, e1. And you see the same uh, uh, idea also of the king being left by left alone all right security issues so instead of king h1 knight f2 rook e3 hitting the queen and notice it's hitting the queen whoops sorry about that so knight f2 rook e3 and it's not only attacking the queen is not the only thing being attacked but also here because remember you still have this guy right this this pawn is is useless at this point it can't protect the bishop this is why queen d1 is the only move because it protects against uh of course the capture rook b3 but also protects rook against rook takes f3 and then just queen takes c4 and white's position just proceeds uh to fall apart so this is why uh, Nigel resigned after the move uh, uh, Queen D4 check. So let's go back now into into the game, into those parts where I said we would look at. So this is the opening once again. Notice the weakening, and this is like main line King's Gambit stuff. So don't don't um think I'm trying to refute the King's Gambit. I'm just saying be aware of weakening pawn moves. Okay, so we're gonna go. Critical first critical point of the game. So here again, White has what he wants, but at the cost, right? Cost of development, cost of, of king safety, cost of material, right? Being down a pawn on f4. All right. His job is to try to consolidate, trade off, get to a reasonable ending, and try to win with the central uh, superiority. Here, Nigel played a3. Okay, a3 is not necessarily a bad move, okay, but better alternative is knight e2 here, okay. Knight e2 not only attacks this pawn because, again, you want to even the material, it also protects e4 from the tactic of knight takes e4 that we saw in the game, that knight takes e4 f5 move. Remember, in the game, after a3, we saw this. And then follow up with f5. So instead of a3, knight e2. More pressure on the center, c3. And remember, with the queen in front of the rook like that on e7, white doesn't have to worry about e4 for the moment, right? Because the knight and bishop are enough to uh, protect. So king b8, queen d3, rook hg8. And now bishop d2. All right. Consolidating. Right. He could take. All right. It's possible. But again, with the king in the middle, like that, you have to be careful. That's why it's important to wait until you get your king safe. And then you start worrying about 
capturing, even up, evening up material, etc. So instead of bishop takes f4, just bishop d2 here. Okay, now, now you can capture because notice the knight leaves f6 to play to g4. So therefore, you don't have to worry about e4 being captured. Now you capture the pawn. Knight takes f2. King takes f2. Now your king has been forced to move. But hey, listen, if you play the king's gambit, you're already used to these type of scenarios. All right, where you have to castle by hand. Your king is taking a walk every now and then. You can't have everything, but this is like the best case scenario probably. Bishop g7. Bishop g5. Bishop f6. Queen d2. Bishop g5. H takes. And I just left it here just to give you an example of what the position uh, would look like. So you can see here, both sides have chances. Yeah, white has the preponderance in the center. Black has good development. White will be able to catch up in development too. But his king is a little drafty. So these are the, the, the factors in the position. And I would say this position is close to uh, being equal. Black definitely doesn't have anything to worry about. Both sides have their chances so 92 is definitely a recommendation that uh you know it's good you know as opposed to a3 is a3 bad i don't think it's bad let's go to my next variation so after a3 knight takes e4 was played in the game i don't think that a3 was bad in itself i think nigel's response just wasn't the best response. So instead of knight d5 here, just take the knight. Knight f takes e4, f f5, right? Because white has to, uh, black just can't give up a piece. And now knight d5, hitting the queen. Queen e8, right? Because the queen has to maintain the pin. Knight df6 with the harassment. All right, and now queen f7. Of course, the knights, you know, are protecting each other. So this is why the queen can um, get off the e file and still uh, capture the piece. So knight d7, and instead of capturing the d7 knight, you capture the uh, e4 knight because now you're threatening the bishop on f3 and. The knight on d7 guaranteed to uh, get the material back. So bishop g4. And now black gives up the exchange. Rook d7. Castles. Rook g8. d5. And knight e7. Now to me this position is very, very dynamic. Very dynamic. Both sides have chances. Um... White eventually is going to play, well, just go ahead, bishop e6, and get the exchange. Queen e7, bishop takes, f5, etc. And again, my variation goes on, on and on, like I said. But the point is, I just wanted to show you the alternative. So it's not all lost uh, for White. Don't think just because White lost the game that, okay, you can't play that line. It's just that White just has to improve. So, A3 is playable, but, I mean, I like the black side. Even though black is down the exchange, I, I would prefer to, to, you know, play black with those rolling pawns and attacking chances uh, there against the, uh, against the king. So, if that type of position is not for you, I would not play the move A3, right, and allow such a position. Allow knight takes e4. If that position bothers you, you play knight e2. And it's a little more conservative. So let's continue. So a3, knight takes e4. Remember, knight d5 was played in the game, but I'm recommending knight f takes e4. It's better. So knight d5, game continue, queen e8, castle. And now you can see black starts to cement his positional advantages because white is not really confronting the idea rookie one queen f7 bishop takes 
takes, takes, 97. And to me, here's like the last like mistake or the big mistake that Nigel made was going into this line. Of course, he probably felt he had compensation on this um, on, with Queen B3 and um, can play against B7. So just to refresh, he played Knight takes E4 here. F takes, Rook takes E4, and then he got caught up in this um, uh, situation where he wind up ultimately having to give up the exchange right after D5. So after Knight E7, White shouldn't be in a rush to capture this pawn because of D5. So instead of playing Knight takes E4, White should play D5 himself, which prevents Black from playing D5. And now he's actually threatening... To just get his pawn back. Of course, black can move. So black just plays knight f6. Queen d4. Hitting um, the pawn. King moves over. And now you can see three pieces attacking the uh, the uh, d pawn. But, but white has three pieces protecting. So c4. Knight g6. And again, this is just sample lines. Knight takes, queen takes. And you can also see thematic here is the use of the g file. Again, this is another position that um, you know both sides have chances. Right? Black is, is developed. Um, white is now consolidated himself. Um, but black has a, a better attacking chances because the g file is already open. Right? But white has equalized the material. White has some more space on the queen side. But again, it's still relatively close. So um, black is is uh, more prepared to start his attack right now. All right. White still needs more more time. White needs to play B4. White needs to develop the rook on A1 still. All right. Give a couple of more moves, for example. So queen H6. Say rook E7. Knight G4. Takes, takes, b4, queen takes h4, rook takes h7, queen g5, and g3. And again, you know, again, it's close to being equal, but you can see white getting checkmated, right, somehow. Just imagine if you had this position. You know, black's position is a little more solid than white's, especially... In the king safety uh, department. So those are the variations and in, in improvements that I would give uh, for white there. Is it probably play d5 here. Because after knight takes e4, he just kind of rapidly goes downhill uh, in spite of a valiant effort. Again, I already discussed uh, what happens on bishop d5. A3. Knight e7. Right? Knight e7 is meant by queen takes. And it's just not enough for, uh, for white to deal with. Alright, so c6. Rook f1, queen g5, c4, rook e8, knight d1, queen h4, d5, and then queen d4. And Nigel Short had to resign. So that is it for this game. Uh, please get in that comment section. Most importantly, just hit the like button. Uh, feel free to support the channel. Check on the links below. Also remember, Chess Audiobooks is on Lee Chess. Chess Audiobooks is on chess.com. Um... And I'm always playing like one minute games. I love playing bullet chess. Um, I, I play longer games from time to time, but there's a lot of cheaters on there. So on those sites. So I don't have time for that. So I like to play one minute, a lot of one minute games. So if you see me on there, just give me a shout out. Send me a friend request. I will accept. And uh, get in that comment section. Let me know what you think. And, um, you know, like I said, once again, hit that thumbs up button. And uh hope you enjoyed that. And I'll see you guys on the next video.